welcome to this review of my Zenith ZKB2, or for those who are still having difficulties with the alphabet, the Zenith ZKB2. This is basically a Redux video, as I've previously shown a ZKB2R, which is almost exactly the same, but I really wanted to Redux this one. See, although it may look somewhat unassuming, the ZKB2 is actually one of my very favorite keyboards, and as it happens, I own three of these bad boys now. I've got two here and a third on the way from the US, which is where the vast majority of these Zenith boards can be found, by the way. A lot of people have asked me over the years what my daily driver keyboard is, and I generally reply with none, because of course here at home I have to keep switching boards constantly to test them out for you guys. So I change boards really frequently, generally multiple times per week. However, my keyboard at work I don't change, partly because that would be quite a palaver to do, and partly because this one is pretty much perfect for the office. The switches, Green Alps, are very nice and not too loud, but I'll get to that in more detail later. I hold her over from work for the occasion, and as you can see, it's <laughs> definitely seen some use. In fact, I've been using it in my office for five or six years now, I think. I even typed my thesis on it. You'll even note that the typing demonstration at the end of the video is faster than normal because this is the only keyboard I really get to get long-term use with, whereas the other ones are all one-week stands, so to speak. Zenith Data Systems was part of Zenith Electronics, which was originally a radio company, and they were also known for their old TVs. Then, in 1979, they decided to branch out into the personal computer market, buying up Heathkit to start their PC division, which they named Zenith Data Systems. Zenith still exists as part of LG, and the Data Systems division was sold off to Bull and then merged with Packet Bell and NEC. Zenith made four related brother keyboards starting in the late 80s. Although there is a definitive generationality to them, they were manufactured with huge production overlap, so they mostly ran alongside each other. The oldest one is this XT type model, then came the AT type one, then the ZKB2, which was AT XT switchable, and finally this KBD17, which was an updated and cheapified version of the ZKB2. That one has the least overlap with the other models. I originally got this R model as a trade, and although it certainly wasn't clean or rust-free, it was, and even now still is, quite smooth. And I haven't even mothered it or anything at all. If anything, I've been pretty sloppy with it, but it's still very nice to use, and it works great. And that's because these things were built to last. Zenith Data Systems didn't focus too much on the retail market because they managed to secure several extremely lucrative contracts with the US government, particularly with the armed forces, and it feels like they knew it too because it's built like a tank. Definitely a military-grade feeling keyboard, this. It's quite often said that the best, or at least the toughest, Alp chassis is that of the Northgate Omni Key, which I'll be showing another video of at some point too. But to be honest, I'd say this one is at least as good. They share a few traits, like the Omni Key, it has both a steel mounting plate as well as a steel back panel, and the weights are comparable as well. The ZKB2 is about 70 grams heavier at 2085 grams compared to 2015 for the Omni Key 101. Or for my alphabet inconversant viewers again, 4.60 and 4.44 pounds respectively. With the Zenith, the weight is a bit more concentrated in the assembly than it is on the Omni Key. The plate on the Zenith weighs around 700 grams and is one millimeter thick, while the plate on the Omni Key is 834 grams. It's 1.3 millimeters thick on that, but that includes a textured paint layer, so that doesn't actually say all that much. The plates on both of them are pretty much just flattened frying pans, though it's ridiculous. Listen to this. It's, <laughs> what the hell? I mean, can you imagine a keyboard coming out nowadays with this much steel on it? I mean, this back panel alone weighs more than most modern keyboards do. And the back panel is only a third of the weight of the whole keyboard. The weight between the ZKB2 and ZKB2R is slightly different. The 2R is 40 grams heavier yet, at about 2125 grams in total. But the back panel is the same, about 700 grams. To be honest, this difference could well be due to condition or manufacturing tolerances. I don't know how significant this is. By the way, as you can see, the back panel is actually one of those electroplated pieces of rainbow steel, which looks awesome. The ZKB2Rs is <laughs> quite rusty, though, as you can see. And, as it happens, 
it doubles as a gong. Also, both the ZKB2 and the Omni key have a feature that's fairly uncommon on vintage mechanical keyboards, N-key rollover, which is always a nice bonus. This thing is just such a workhorse. I mean, it's from 1988 and it clearly did a lot of servers already and I haven't even been all that kind to it, but it just keeps on going. Once every few months I have to clean out the T switch because that one sometimes gets scratchy, but that's about it. And let's not forget, I could bash someone's fucking head in with it if I so desired. I mean, <laughs> what a keyboard! The cable is also excellent. It's very thick and sturdy, but unlike thick modern cables, it's still very pliable and not in the way because it's coiled. So if you need the length, it can stretch like this, and if not, you can easily tuck it away. And the coils bend easily, so it doesn't hang around like a piece of rebar. It's really a shame they don't do this sort of thing very often anymore today. Interestingly, the cable is fixed at the left side rather than coming out of the back like most keyboards, although other Zenith boards have this too. Because this takes up some extra horizontal space, I cut holes in their boxes like this, which makes them very recognizable in my keyboard wall. The keycaps are also nice, just like the Omni keys, they're double shot ABS, but unlike the Omni keys, they're not focus style ones. In fact, I think it's not really known who made these keycaps, or even the board itself actually, but based on the keycaps, I'd guess it was Ciccone, which would be pretty ironic, considering most of their own boards were built about as well as a bowl of porridge. I think I said in the original video that this was made by Alps Electric, but in retrospect, I don't think that's true. What I do know is that it's made in Taiwan. The switches on these are excellent. I made sure all my ZKB2s have green Alps, although they could also come with the later yellow Alps. However, SKCL yellow are a bit too stiff for me. Green Alps are nice and light and pretty much perfect for me. The weight and travel characteristics of green Alps are just really nice in my opinion. In fact, this was the first linear switch I even liked. Although those modern contactless switches, such as optoelectric boards and Hall Effect ones, have since surpassed it completely in terms of smoothness, I still have a soft spot for these. They sound great too, just like you would expect of Alps, but like many green Alp chassis, it does ping like a motherfucker. If you're unsure of whether these have green or yellow Alps and you can't see a picture with a keycap off in the listing, a useful rule of thumb I found is to look at the model sticker and if it's got one of these fat letters printed on it, it's very likely to have green Alps. It's not 100%, but I think I only managed to find two or three exceptions to this rule among several dozen that I looked at, so it's a decent indicator at least. Perhaps a useful footnote here is that if you don't feel like hunting down pristine condition green Alps but still want a taste of them, a much better alternative is to get an 8101 or something with black Alps. If you linearize those, you end up with something very similar, just as good really, and because black Alps are some of the last production complicated Alp switches, and green Alps are the very first ones, it's much easier to get black Alps in good condition and for less money to boot, although of course then you don't get the Zenith chassis with that. Now, if you're worried about the lack of feedback from linear switches, don't worry, Zenith's got you covered. Like other Zenith keyboard models, it comes with a piezoelectric beeper in there to tell you when a key's been pressed. Listen to this. Personally, I always have it off, and it's especially obnoxious when it engages the Typematic. But hey, it's there if you need it. You can turn it off with Alt plus tilde, by the way. The layout is also very nice. It's a readily identifiable layout that looks a bit like a focus one with some very specific changes that I haven't seen on anything else. Like a focus layout, it uses a big ass enter with a full size backspace and a split right shift. But instead of a big ass enter, it's actually more of a medium ass enter. Second, they average the numpad zero and point keys into two one and a half unit keys instead of a two unit zero and a one unit point, which is an improvement in my opinion, as the decimal point is at least as important as the zero. 
Third, they used a Win keyless layout, of course, as this keyboard predates Windows 95 by 7 or 8 years, but the gap that's normally between the Control and Alt keys has been narrowed by making both of these keys a quarter unit bigger, which makes them easier to find and hit while still maintaining that gap for reference purposes. You know, it's easier to reliably find these keys without looking if you have that gap to work with. Plus, it makes it so that you don't accidentally hit both of them at once, or at least makes it very difficult to do so. Interestingly, the increased size of the Control and Alt keys led Zenith to have all four of them stabilized. So it's got as many as 12 stabilized keys compared to the more common nine. They even went as far as to lubricate the stabilizers to mitigate rattle of the stabilizer bars. Now, this is a bit of a mystery to be honest. Some say that this is one of the differences between the ZKB2 and the ZKB2R. Supposedly, the R model would come with lubricant, while the ZKB2 didn't. I know of people with non-lubricated ZKB2s, but mine is lubed. But then again, the amount is much less than the giant wads that were on my ZKB2R. And this was second hand, so I can't tell who put it there. So actually, I can neither confirm nor deny this. Another interesting feature is the use of integrated lock lights rather than a dedicated lock light bank, which is normally here on full size keyboards. Now you might be wondering why I like that, but the reason is that I can then use this empty space for post-its, which I consume in vast quantities. And the pencil tray at the top here is very useful as well. The bezel is big enough that it can comfortably hold both my small and my big mechanical pencil. Nice. The colour of the lock lights is a rather obvious difference between the ZKB2 and the 2R, by the way. They're green on the ZKB2 and red on the 2R, although it's very difficult to see the green lights under this camera angle. I have to say, it is tempting to think that that's what the R in the ZKB2R is for. So apart from outstanding build quality, easily rivaling, if not outright surpassing that of an IBM Model M, it's got great keycaps, delicious switches, a nice layout, and even N-key rollover. Also, it's an extremely good looking keyboard in my opinion. She's a classy lassie with a slimline chassis, and I really like the Zenith logo too. It's one of the, if not the, best looking ones in the business in my opinion. That Lightning logo just has something really, really cool about it, I think. Their original logo, from when they were just a radio company, was also awesome. Looks almost like a tattoo or something. Someone actually sent me the metallic logo plate from an old XT class Zenith Z150, which fits this recess perfectly. And even though it's kind of battered, it looks gorgeous. That silver and gold and black metal is just so good looking. Maybe once I've messed up my work Zenith so much that it warrants a full on restoration, I'll look into getting some replacement XT style badges made somewhere. It's apparently quite hideously expensive to do so, and I'm not sure where I could even have something like that done in the first place, but if any board deserves it, it's this one. When I do restore it, I may have it repainted as well, just like this Zenith build from Gainsborough. I mean, is she a jaw dropper or what? Fucking hell. The logo plate can be taken out, be very careful as the plate legs are actually quite fragile, to reveal an ATXT switch underneath with which you can set the protocol. Interestingly, when using a Saurus converter, this ZKB2 acts almost like it's in XT mode sometimes when it's set to AT, and it doesn't work at all in XT mode, but it does work properly when used over PS2. Confusingly, this is also a ZKB2 XT rather than a pure ZKB2, and the ZKB2R has a similar issue as well, so I'm not really sure what's causing that. Overall, I love this thing to bits. It's just such a likeable old workhorse, and it never lets me down. I've been wanting to do this Redux for a while too, to show you how much I enjoy it. Thankfully, now I've amassed enough of them that I should never have to be without one, which is... <laughs> nice. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.